Well, good evening, and welcome to New Bethel's Wednesday night Bible study and prayer time. We've been discussing over the last several weeks becoming stronger spiritually. We began with the discipline of solitude. Now, solitude, as I'm using it in this study, means finding a place free of distractions. We see in Scripture several instances where Jesus got up early and went up into the hills of Galilee. The crowds and their needs, the teaching and the healing, the feeding of thousands, even the disciples were a distraction when it came to Jesus having a quiet moment with the Father. It was not that he wanted to get away from people or that the disciples were annoying, although sometimes I think that they were. It was just a personal need for a time where Jesus could be free from distractions. Now, if Jesus needed to do that, we said, so do we, so do you, so do I. And when we're in our, what did the Superman movies call it, fortress of solitude, or as Jesus simply called it, your closet, your inner room, then we need to work on the second discipline, which is prayer. Last week I said that prayer is a conversation with God. Yes, include your list of prayer requests and personal needs, family needs, community needs. You may have a short list or a long list, but also including your prayer time, you should include listening. Listening. Your quiet place, in your quiet place, you need to be quiet. Let the Lord speak to you, which brings us to today. One of the ways the Lord can speak to you is through His Word. God's Word is given to us to help us understand and relate to God and to improve ourselves. D.L. Moody used to say, the Bible was not given to increase our knowledge, but to change our lives. How do we study the Bible? How do you approach Bible study? If we listen to the words of the prophet Jeremiah, we get a really good perspective. Jeremiah 15, 16 says, Your words were found, and I ate them, and your words became to me a joy and the delight of my heart. Do you have an appetite for God's word? That's a really good place to start. When you're in your prayer closet, when you're in your quiet place, start by asking God to give you a desire, a hunger for His Word. If you can develop that hunger for God's Word, Jeremiah indicates that studying the Bible will become a joy and a delight to your heart. In these days, could you ask for anything greater than a heart filled with joy and delight? How do you study your Bible. I want to give you a really simple approach. This system, if you want to call it that, is something which you can build upon and grow as you develop a more intense desire to eat more of God's Word. For this system, we're going to use an acronym from the word READ. R-E-A-D. The R is simply READ. The E is EXPLAIN. The A is analyze, and the D stands for digest. So read, explain, analyze, and digest. Let me describe each one of those briefly. Read is, well, kind of obvious. You make intentional time to read the Scripture. Now, for study purposes, this is not a day-by-day, read-the-Bible-in-a-year kind of reading. You can do that at another time. If I can paraphrase something Charles Spurgeon said, some people like to read so many chapters every day. I would not discourage them from the practice, but I, he says, I would rather let my soul soak in half a dozen verses all day than I would, as it were, rinse my hands in several chapters. So, take up the practice of reading. Read comfortably and casually. Read a, free, a few verses, or at most, a few paragraphs. Most of our Bibles make this easier. They're divided into sections inside each chapter. Read a section or two. For today, in today's 
beacon, for example, in today's beacon, um, I suggested we read from Matthew chapter 7. Now, in my English Standard Version that I like to read, Matthew chapter 7 is divided into seven subsections with a little title by each one. In the Christian Standard Bible, chapter 7 is only divided into four. The last two sections in the ESV are the same as the last section in the Christian Standard Bible. Those verses are 24 through 29. Now, that's only six verses, and it only takes a moment or two to read them. But remember, the goal here is not reading X number of verses or so many chapters. The goal is studying and enjoying and gaining joy from your Bible study. So I suggest this. Read the verses through once, then stop. And in your quiet place, ask the Lord to help you soak, as Spurgeon put it, in his word. Then read the verses again, this time slowly and intentionally, concentrating on each word. Why don't we do that right now? If you have your Bible, turn to Matthew 7, 24 through 29. Verse 24. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock and the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand and the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. And when Jesus finished these sayings, <coughs> excuse me, the crowds were astonished at his teaching for he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as their scribes. The second step is E, explain. By explain, I mean, what does this passage say? What's the subject? Who is being addressed? In Matthew chapter 7, we know this passage is at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. So the people addressed are those that gathered around Jesus to hear him teach. The crowd would have been made up of ordinary people from all walks of life as well as his disciples. The subject of these verses is both on listening and doing what Jesus said. The illustration in the passage is a storm that hits two different houses with completely different effects. One house stands and one house fell. As you reflect on the passage, if there's a word you don't understand, this is a good point to look it up. The third step is A, analyze. In this step, we want to ask, what does the passage mean? Another question which is very helpful in analyzing the meaning of the passage is to ask, why was this important to the original readers or hearers? In Matthew 7, what did this mean to those that were sitting on the mountainside listening to Jesus? Well, in our passage, the basic meaning for them and for us, I think, the basic meaning of the lesson was Jesus is teaching that it's far wiser to listen and do than it is to listen and not do. The comparison is between two men who each built homes. Each man heard the words of Jesus. The wise man listened and did what Jesus taught. The picture is that he built his house on a solid rock foundation. The second man heard the same words of Jesus but chose not to do them. He's called a foolish man who built his house on an unstable, sandy foundation. One house stood and the other house fell. One man was wise, the other man was foolish. One man did what Jesus taught, the other ignored Jesus' teaching. What did this mean to those that were listening to Jesus on the mountainside? That's a good question to ask. Verse 28 and 29 tells us they were astonished. Jesus taught like he had authority, and he taught with great meaning in his words. The comparison was to the teachers of the law, the scribes, who apparently 
qualified everything they said, and offered various opinions on every subject. Jesus represented a different kind of teacher and taught in a more meaningful way. So what he was teaching that day had value and importance to those that listened. The fourth step is D, which stands for digest. Now, when we eat food, take food into our system, uh, our digestive system takes what we've eaten and gives us the nutrients we need from that food. Here, what we're talking about is getting what we need from the Bible passage. You might want to ask, what does this passage mean to me? Or what am I going to do about what this passage says? As I digest the verses at the end of Matthew 7, it means for me that I should take seriously the things I read in the Bible. I need to pay attention to what I read, and I need to do what I am learning. I also see in this passage that both men were hit by storms. Now, in a way, that's comforting and helpful to me. I know that I've faced storms in my life before and will surely face other storms. If I'm wise and I digest what God's Word says to me and I apply those things to my life, then I'll weather the storms of life. And if I do not do what I learned, what I see here is that storms can be very costly. So in closing, let me encourage you to R-E-A-D your Bible. Read slowly and carefully. Explain the passage in terms of the who and the what and maybe even the why and the when. And then analyze the passage for meaning and value, especially for the original readers or hearers. And then finally, digest the passage for yourself. And again, do all of this as part of your solitude and prayer time. Let the Word of God speak to you. And as you study His Word, be sure to close your time asking for strength to do what you have learned that day. Now, I hope you've had a chance to look at the beacon, uh, our prayer guide, and you'll let that instruct your prayers for our church and for others that are listed there. And as always, if you know of someone that we need to add to our church prayer list, would you please let me know that? So let's close our time together in prayer today. Father, thank you for your word today. Thank you for the simple instruction that Jesus gave us that we need to both listen and pay attention, but we also need to do what we see there. Lord, help us to be not only hearers, but doers of your word. And Father, by doing, we'll have the opportunity to influence others, to see, uh, for them to see in our lives the meaning that we find in Scripture, the meaning that we find in our relationship with Jesus. Lord, we know there's several on our prayer list today. In broad strokes, there are still folks in our community suffering with the coronavirus. We pray for their health and strength and for the, the establishment um, of their health coming back. We pray, Father, for protection for those that have been exposed or will be exposed. Uh, we ask, Father, for wisdom for our government leaders here in our county, in our state, and nationally as we begin to have conversations about stopping this shutdown and getting people back to work. So we pray also for the economy and for uh, individuals and their individual economy, for people that need to get back to their jobs, need to find a new job. We pray, Father, for the economic recovery from this virus as much as we pray right now for the physical recovery from the illness. We pray for those recovering from the tornado. We know that most, we think, most of those hit had some sort of insurance. They'll be restored eventually. We pray for strength and comfort in those times. And for those that didn't have the right amount or the, any insurance at all, Lord, we pray that you, would, uh, that you would restore them yourself. You would use uh, us, use others like us, believers, to help make those folks whole again as much as possible to restore those. And we pray, Father, for members of our congregation and friends 
who have been ill. Uh, we pray for Lloyd Harville in his recovery from his heart surgery. We pray for others on our list that are recovering from long-term illnesses. We remember again, Father, the those that are in nursing homes that can't have family come and see them. And I can just imagine the loneliness and, and the, the heartache that's a part of that. And we pray, Father, for you to be their comforter, for your Holy Spirit to build them up and keep them strong in these days. And we pray for their protection also from this coronavirus. We pray for our church, for wisdom for us as we approach these days, as we would know what to do and how to minister not only to each other but to our community, that we'd have wisdom and knowing what to do about coming back together and that you would guide us in all of these things. We're thankful for your word. We pray that you'd help us to read your word and then do what we understand it to say. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you for being with me to, tonight. I, I keep watching for better guidance and more specific instruction for churches, for reopening. And as of when I recorded this, uh, we have sort of a vague statement from the governor who says more details will be coming. And the county still says no more than 10 people, but more details whenever that is are going to be coming. Uh, that doesn't mean that we don't have some exciting news I want to share with you tonight. This coming Sunday, which would be May the 3rd, we're going to do a drive-in service in our church parking lot. We'll have our deacons on site helping you to park and line up so we can put as many people as possible there. We'll tell you what station to tune your car FM radio to in order to hear the service. Uh, there, there is one way, as you're thinking about this, that you might help, and in the past, we've had some families come in multiple cars, and this week, as much as it's possible, we're asking you to come together. We, we do, after all, have a fairly limited parking lot. The staff's already worked on some of the systems to make sure all of this is going to work, and we are really looking forward to seeing you in person, even if it's through a windshield, in person on Sunday. We do understand that a drive-in might not be comfortable for everyone, so we're also going to have the service online on Sunday morning, just like we have been doing. John Deacle is again this week going to do our Sunday school lesson, and it will also be online Sunday morning at 10 o'clock, so you can go back up. I'll make it 9.30. The Sunday school lesson will be available at 9.30 so that you can study your Sunday school lesson at home before you come to our drive-in worship at 11. God bless you. I am looking forward to seeing you this Sunday.